The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Um, welcome everyone, nice to have you here tonight. Uh, I'll explain the format to the extent that I understand it, but I may have to rely on uh, Alex Barner or someone else to clarify it. As I understand it, we'll have, I believe, both speakers first. Is that correct, Alex? And then we'll have question and answer following uh, both of the speakers, and I'll introduce them one at a time so you see me again in a, in a few minutes. Um, our first speaker tonight will be Professor Ibrahim Musa of Duke University, Department of Religion. Um, I think you have in your handout materials, you have a sort of, do you have handout materials? You don't, oh, well then I'll give you a little more information than I might have otherwise. Um, he is, as I say, Associate Professor of Islamic Studies in the Department of Religion at Duke University. Um, he has a very interesting background from my point of view and your point of view. Um, he has, uh, as you would expect, uh, academic training in religious studies, uh, which he took at the University of Cape Town um, in uh, 1995, took his PhD, and he wrote a highly acclaimed book on the uh, medieval Islamic uh, theologian uh, Al Ghazali, called Ghazali and the Poetics of Imagination, uh, which won an important award from the American Academy of Religion. Um, but in addition to his, what we might call, ordinary uh, academic training, um, he also holds a degree in Islamic and Arabic studies from the Dar Ulum Nedwat al Ulama, uh, an important madrasa in Lucknow, India. Uh, so this is a very unusual combination of sort of traditional training of the Islamic ulama, or the Muslim ulama, in, in a very traditional madrasa, well-established one, uh, one of the leading ones in India, as well as, we might say, Western-style uh, academic training. He also has a postgraduate diploma in journalism from uh, the City University of London. So he kind of combines uh, in himself and in his own training a lot of different dimensions of things that are very much of interest to us today. He's been active as a journalist, but he's also been active as um, an academician, uh, has taught at Stanford University uh, and uh, where else? University of Cape Town in South Africa before uh, going to Duke University to teach, finally. Um, and he's uh, sort of well uh, exposed as a political commentator in the press at various times. Um, he's completing another book uh, now called Muslim Self-Revival, Ethics, Rights, and Technology After Empire, uh, and an, yet another book called Between Right and Wrong, Debating Muslim Ethics. And I think he's also at work on a book on the madrasa, no? Am I correct in that? So he brings a kind of rich background to our discussions today. So I'll hand the podium over to him, and uh, then after he's done, I'll come and introduce our second speaker. Good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Donner, for that warm and generous introduction. Um, on tonight's topic, I thought I will touch and talk about three issues and hopefully um, share with you uh, several um, ideas and concepts that will open up and create opportunities for discussion and debate. I will talk a little bit about the, um, possibly mostly on the madrasas of South Asia and especially um, the madrasas of India and Pakistan. I'll also talk about the most recent political uprisings and my take of them in, in uh, Tunisia uh, and Egypt and Libya we cannot comment on because it's still a work in progress, but um, a lot of developments are there. And thirdly, I'll talk about um, US politics and Muslims, especially in the light of last week's uh, congressional hearings. <clears throat> listen, listen, this is a school, it's not a madrasa. The combat of Professor Nadia Bly yells at her student minutes into David Hare's 2005 play, The Vertical Hour. We're not teaching one path, we're teaching many paths, she warns her student, Dennis Dutton. You say you admire liberal democracy? Well, basic to liberal democracy is the idea of free discussion the free exchange of ideas, comparison. When high and lowbrow artists, movie scriptwriters, journalists, and playwrights no longer feel compelled to translate a foreign word like madrasa for the English-speaking readers, then you know, for better or for worse, that the ideas arrived in the imagination of the news-consuming Western public. 
Whether distorted in the news or skewered by pundits, the term madrasa slinked into the Euro-American political lexicon and was yoked to a string of scary media terms like holy war, jihad, terrorism, and Islam. Yet we need to ask, are madrasas really those dangerous places that people imagine them to be? Words like madrasa and jihad are surely part of the daily vocabulary as well as experience of millions of people around the world. Human beings who are both different as well as similar to people living in the West. In fact, madrasas embody the lives and histories of people and institutions in the present who are not only connected to an ancient intellectual and scholarly tradition of Islamdom, but these people also proudly view their association with such figures and places that are linked to the madrasas as the fulfillment of their highest aspirations and their most deeply felt needs. Since 2004, I've been making frequent trips to madrasas in India and Pakistan and countries around the world where such institu institutions flourish. I wanted to check for myself how it is that these institutions have such a notorious reputation compared to the ones in which I had studied some three decades ago. What has changed? And what is going on beyond the walls of hundreds, if not thousands, of madrasas on the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent? How did madrasas get linked to terrorism? David Hare's play, The Vertical Hour, effectively sets up the scenario as to what preoccupies Western audiences today. The ongoing war on terror, waged and led by America in Afghanistan and, and in Iraq, but also on multiple other fronts, particularly Yemen and Somalia, has created disagreements between governments and citizens in Europe and in America. I know many people were unhappy about some of these engagements. More than anything else, America's wars have generated feverish resentment towards the United States around the Muslim world. European opposition to the Iraq war seemed antithetical to Americans like Bly, this character in David, David Hare's uh, play, this Professor uh, uh, Nadia Bly. She's in the play a former war correspondent and ardent supporter of US military intervention in global affairs. Bly, the Yale University politics professor, uh, politics uh, professor in the play, promptly justifies her political commitments by explaining that she had witnessed, quote, suffering at the ground level in places like Bosnia. And I think this question about intervention like Bosnia, the United States intervened, again raises the question right now that is on everybody's hearts and minds, the question, do we intervene in Libya right now? And what will that intervention look like? In order to prevent future Bosnias, Nadia Bly believes, Western countries have to use, quote, their muscle to free Arabs from systematic murder, end of quote. Bly becomes a ventriloquist for the myriads of Euro-American rationales offered as justification and as reasons to first invade Afghanistan in 2001 and then Iraq in 2003. If politics was about, quote, the reconciliation of the irreconcilable, unquote, as Professor Bly counseled, entrenched in systems such as capitalism, communism, liberal democracy, or industrial military interests, as well as cultivating an open mind, then her graduating student, the undergraduate, Dennis Dutton, held a simpler view. For Dennis Dutton says, for me, and Dutton is an ardent libertarian and an isolationist, Dutton snaps, politics is about the protection of property and of liberty. In a telling riposte, he asks, he asks, Dutton says, why? Why would I want an open mind? Nadia says, why would you not? Dutton, our enemies don't have an open mind. The brief staged exchange captures the dilemma of the liberal West's claims and the relationships to other cultures and religions. Are the commitments to the much vaunted credos of liberal education held by the warmongering political science professor, namely dispassionately comparative and open-minded, is that not a smokescreen or genuine attempt to understand, or is, that, or is that a genuine attempt to understand the other? Is that a smokescreen or a real attempt to understand the other? Or is the crude property and liberty hugging students tit for tat credo more genuine if his views are summarized in neocon style or Tea Party style? I do what my enemy does and don't ask me to be nice. Both perspectives depend on the outsider, the foreigner, the alien in question those others deemed to be beyond the fold of Western culture. 
The student is crude in his gesture. He prefers to mimic the other, uh, uh, and therefore there is no need to cultivate an open mind since our enemies don't aspire to such noble ends. As enemies, Dutton might have in mind Muslim terrorists who committed the atrocities of 9-11, or America's adversaries in Afghanistan, Iraq, or perhaps earlier enemies like the communists and the Vietnamese. Professor Bly, while advocating comparison, is neither innocent nor dispassionate. Her conclusions always favor her own interests, despite her mini-sermon on the merits of comparison. It is she who denounces the cultural assets of another civilization as unreflective, narrow-minded madrasas on the grounds of media stereotypes, not credential scholarly research. By which madrasas, but which madrasas was she referring to? She likely did not know that in the Arabic-speaking world, every secular school is called a madrasa. She most probably had in mind the Muslim seminaries of South Asia. Yet these religious institutions are also sites where strong moral convictions and beliefs are displayed, but in the intellectual endeavors, one will find that comparison was at the heart of the enterprise. They're always compar comparing different kinds of theologies, different kinds of laws, difference between themselves and others, and so on. Many, but not all, of the religious authorities and spiritual guides who direct the daily lives of millions of Muslims around the world are trained in madrasas or analogous institutions. Yet one knows little about the everyday existence of those who inhabit these places of learning. Informed discussions about their training, how their spiritual personas and intellectual characters are formed. Even fewer know of their relationship with peers, teachers, and their extended families. And to know more about that, you'll have to wait until I publish my book. More importantly, what books do they read? Which histories and past do they connect to? What kinds of aspirations do they foster? How do they serve their constituencies and make an impact on the world? All these vital human details are cloaked by sensational and dramatic headlines of crazed mullahs and murderous Taliban who came into the public eye in 1994. The most benign of Western media productions and similar images of madrasas in Muslim majority countries can be reduced to the following. One typical image is, a, a, and you'll find it in your daily dose of newspapers or on media images, is of very young children squatting in rows on mats, swinging rhythmically while memorizing the Quran. And so, what is the take home? They only memorize the Quran, they don't learn anything else. That, haven't you heard that over and over? in discussions post 9-11. Another storyline is the perpetual query, why do madrasas not train students in modern sciences like math, science, and the humanities? The model of these cryptic headliners is this. Madrasa students are forced into rote learning and therefore they own no critical skills and have also, also have no tools and skills to play the role of citizenship and participate as beneficiaries of, modern, of the modern nation state. Outsiders possibly will be surprised to learn that madrasas are first and foremost cherished and revered sites, if not sanctified spaces in the social imaginaries of many, many ordinary Muslims. These are moral geographies or spaces first and foremost. Religious practices are designed through scholarship and ideas taught to inhabitants of the madrasas and through discipline and repetitive practice are embodied in their daily lives in an enduring fashion. So it's like going to a seminary or kind of a, 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 or a kind of a monastery and an educational place where you learn certain practices. In short, in madrasas, bodies are shaped, minds are nourished, pasts remembered, and futures are fostered. But as moral geographies, they are equally concerned about their own ethical practice as well as that of others locally and transnationally. This dimension does give the endeavors a, the, the endeavors of people in the madrasa or the denizens of the madrasa, it does give their endeavors a political dimension since the ethical is also political. Madrasa communities are not only concerned about the correct practice of ritual, but they are equally concerned about the global moral order as well as the local political order since these affect their lives. But they, like others, also care for the victims of tsunamis, as they do for fellow humans as well as Muslims, whether they be in apartheid-torn South Africa, for Palestinians occupied and brutalized by Israeli uh, political forces, despotic regimes in the Muslim world, and 
they are also concerned about American and European occupation of Muslim lands. And they are equally concerned about environmental catastrophe, human rights, and the future of humanity in myriads of ways. And the reason we don't know these things, because we don't read them in the vernacular publications, and we don't take the time to explore what is going on there. Education, madrasas, comparisons. How could these age-old categories inseparable in Muslim history be reduced to a single reflex? How could it be that madrasa equals terror, equals absence of respect for liberty, property, and above all, absence of comparison? Reducing the other to the enemy is an act of the imagination, and turning them into inhumane and monochromatic, if not robotic, figures is an act of callousness, but is also a reflex of power. And in the case of European and American media, it is imperial power that, ha that had co-opted the media to do its bidding, to which news outlets have willingly complied to feed the public's anxieties of the faraway barbarians in the madrasas who are a threat to American and European lives. Of course, global developments in the past decade have surely left the impression that the Taliban are the only people associated with both Islam and that they have a monopoly over the madrasas of South Asia. This is the furthest from the truth. Yet the distorted picture might have well captured the imagination of most non-Muslims, even though the propaganda reflect the intentions of those who make such claims. In fact, only a very small unit of the Taliban has a tenuous link to the madrasas. Students called Taliban in Persian is a term by which the former Afghan government was known and has since turned into an anti-occupation insurgency group. And I'm sure my friend, Professor uh, Ahmad, is, uh, Dr. Ah Mr. Ahmad is gonna talk more about that. And in a highly mediatized world, they have monopolized the, the image of all seminary-going Muslim students. Keywords like madrasa and jihad are also shorthand for larger political narratives that occupy debates on global politics and terrorism. The shibboleth, the shibboleth that truth is the first casualty in a war still has some cachet. Then, then if, if, if the shibboleth that truth is the first casualty in a war, then comparison is the second casualty in the mediatized wars of the 21st century. For often, comparisons are done in bad faith in order to deliver fake results meant to serve the ends of propaganda and to mobilize cultural resources against adversaries. So why are Western policymakers, politicians, the media, and pundits at large so, so preoccupied with madrasas? During the past decade, a handful of madrasas have fall in, fallen into the crosshairs of a titanic battle between Euro-American military forces and their militant Muslim adversaries. Foremost among the latter are the Taliban of the failed state of Afghanistan and the international terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, led by the exiled Saudi millionaire Osama bin Laden. If Europeans disagree with Americans about the appropriate response to terror, then many more Muslims remain undecided how to oppose both Western aggression and their own corrupt governments and their terrorists. Now, madrasas, and I'm, this is my prepared statement, I just want to add a little bit more here, and that madrasas are, are places really, a place of learning where people learn tradition, ancient tradition, and where these individuals are trained to become um, lawgivers or people who give ethical guidance. But there is a crisis in the madrasas of South Asia in particular, and especially Pakistan. And that is that given the kind of fact that Pakistan has become the kind of frontline state for almost three decades now for America's wars first against the Soviets and now against Al-Qaeda and Taliban, that Pakistan is becoming cannibalized as a, as a society. And if in the previous wars against the, against, the, uh, against the Soviets, Pakistan's intelligence agencies played the role and also gave refuge to Afghan uh, refugees, those refugees, those Afghan refugees, have over time established networks in which they now occupy certain madrasas where these madrasas are basically hostels where people are basically having some food and having very basic education. These are not the kind of mainstream madrasas where the high intellectual culture is taught. In, like in places like Lahore or Karachi or Multan or other places in Pakistan or in Lucknow, Delhi and myriads of other cities of India or for that matter in Bangladesh. So we need to distinguish between madrasas and madrasas. 
There's also, in every village in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, you're gonna find a madrasa, which is basically Sunday school where kids go for two hours in the morning before they go to secular school. That's also a madrasa, but that's a different kind. The madrasas we are talking about, uh, there are two kinds of madrasas. One is the kind of Afghans, the, the madrasas that are spawned by the Taliban, and some of the Pakistani madrasas that are sympathetic to the Taliban cause, that's one kind of madrasa. But there are other kind of madrasas that teach the Islamic intellectual tradition, the high tradition. But I must tell you that a certain sector of those madrasas, especially the Dioban madrasas, are highly and strongly and increasingly become strongly sympathetic to the Taliban, at least until most recently. And, and, and the, at least the Afghan Taliban, very sympathetic to them. And they are, they one would can say that basically they have become kind of the militant force. So they provide the militancy, not necessarily the kind of the people who engage in jihad, although they sometimes do aspire to do that. Other kinds of madrasas who are of another kind of intellectual orientation, the Barelvi school, are not entirely sympathetic to the Taliban because they are of a different kind of theological orientation. At the same time, given Pakistan's tumultuous last 10 years, and especially in the last two, three years, in incidents such as the blasphemy laws and those kind of things, all the madrasas have got involved. So the politics have now spilled into the madrasas, and the madrasas have become, in some ways, also the shock troops of some of the extremist forces within Pakistan. You're not gonna find that phenomenon in India. And you might find that in a very reduced way in Bangladesh. So it is absolutely problematic to say that the madrasas are bad. One has to find names and addresses of madrasas if you want to condemn them. And you have to identify them. Because the madrasas in, in India are very different. Right now I can tell you that the mother madrasa of which the, Pakistan, the Taliban take intellectual inspiration from, and there's a long history, if someone asks me the question I can elaborate when I'm doing Q&A time, is that in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in Dioban, which is about 100 miles from Delhi, which is the mother madrasa for the, for the Taliban, so to speak, the Dioban school, in January, the board, the trustees of the, of the Dioban installed a new vice chancellor, or the president. And this man is a 60-year-old guy who has established madrasas in other parts of Pakistan. His name is Ghulam Vastanvi. And Vastanvi basically has established schools, madrasas, where he has with the madrasas high schools and college education. And Vastanvi was hired to lead, and, I, and, and the jury is still out, what was the basic reason that he was invited to lead the madrasa and such an important network of madrasas in India? Why was, why was he invited to do so? Uh, one reason is people say that they want, did not want some other groups to take leadership of the madrasa. The other group says that, well, they want someone who's gonna introduce curricular reform. Unfortunately for Vastanvi, he got involved in giving an interview with the Times of India that resulted in a lot of opposition to some of the statements he made about events nine years ago, and there was a lot of kind of demonstration against him, so right now there's a committee of inquiry exploring his, his utterances, and some people believe that that committee of inquiry is either going to give him a, a, a clear him, or it might be uh, the committee that's gonna boot him out for he said certain things about, about, about the Gujarat riots that happened in 2003. Um, but I think it's important to point out that in ma the madrasas in many places have become kind of rhetorically militant and have very little sympathy for developments in the West, even though they might admire certain, certain aspects of Western culture and civilization. And it's not so clear cut also because you do have madrasas in Buffalo, you have a madrasa in Chicago where people are doing other kinds of activities and are not necessarily engaged in undermining the state or law and order or anything of that sort. It's purely a religious endeavor and, and finding a certain kind of orientation uh, for, uh, for, for, uh, for Muslims who want a, a more traditional uh, orientation. Let's just move to the, the developments in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in North Africa. I want us to think back immediately after 9-11. And what was the rhetoric after 9-11? The rhetoric we had about, in very kind of monolithic and generalizing terms was, 
they, that is the Muslims, they hate us for our freedoms. Wasn't that the, the, the call? We, wasn't that drilled into our ears by our media and by the people we pay our taxes to, to, to do our bidding? How do you explain that? That 10 years later, these very people are dying for their freedom on the streets of Cairo, in Tunisia, in Bahrain, and in Libya. So it does say that something is wrong in our analytic. And it was wrong at that time, and it was wrong now. Muslims have been aspiring for freedoms. They went through the anti-colonial struggle, and then the post-colonial blues, and all this kind of developments. And what we do not, what we do not want to appreciate is that what, what the sane voices within our societies have been telling us that we have been keeping the bad guys on top of the necks of those people and brutalizing those people. And that brutalization produced the bin Ladens and his shock troops. Not entirely true, because partly true, because Zawahiri was, who was bin Laden's number two and possibly the most dangerous man in, in Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri. He was, a, he was a physician in Cairo who was brutalized by the regime after Sadat was killed, and he vowed to take revenge. And many of those groups from Algeria and other places were part of that, and others were also going in for the romance of jihad and not necessarily uh, part of the, uh, the, 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 the victims of, of dictatorships. So in the light of developments right now, we need to ask the question whether the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, whether they were valuable exercises in nation building. We really need to ask that question. And, and were they good models of nation building? Whereas in fact, hopefully, Tunisians and Egyptians and other parts of the world, and everybody's now loosening up, might be building for themselves futures that be, might be much more enduring and futures that they own. In fact, the, the futures that we are trying to dole out with billions of dollars in Afghanistan and Iraq, we are owning it. Afghans and Iraqis are not owning it. And no Afghan uh, or Iraqi ownership. Yes, we are looking at Karzai and, and Maliki, whose fate might turn out to be worse than that of Mubarak and Ben Ali. And I, I'm not sitting in front of a crisp, uh, uh, you know, crystal ball here, but it might be five or 10 years before we see the back of some of those people, if not earlier. And one does not have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. In Afghanistan, Bing West's book, The Wrong War, shows that America is on, on the way to coming away from there with very little dividends. Um, the only Afghans invested in Afghanistan are the kleptocrats and the drug lords and the warlords. They are making a roaring trade, but they are also, they are also mobile with getaways in Dubai and parts of Pakistan. So what we have really have here in some of these developments and, and our understanding of politics of the Middle East up to, up to this point, especially after 9-11, was always that of polarized perception of, 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 of our perceptions of global politics as us versus them. And we are frequently told that we live in a flat world, a world where borders have become redundant. We really need to ask now, in a world in which borders have become redundant, the free flow of goods and ideas and, and concepts and so on, whether we still can maintain a policy of hegemony and a policy where we want to argue that what, how does the foreign, our foreign policy serve our interests? I think one will, we will have to begin thinking about foreign policy options in which we think about co global coexistence rather than uh, of domination and hegemony. Um, in fact, the developments in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in North Africa is something that caught everybody by surprise. On the 14th of January of this year, I was in Al Ghat, which is about 250 kilometers outside of Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. I was invited by a foundation called the Sudeiri Foundation uh, for a one-day workshop. So on the 14th of of January, which is a Friday, we had a long breakfast uh, with several distinguished people from the Saudi elite establishment uh, and establishment people there, including, including uh, Prince uh, Turki Al Faisal. Turki Al Faisal, as you would know, was the former ambassador to London and also very short uh, for a short term to Washington. And prior to that, he was the head of Saudi national intelligence. Turki Al Faisal as we were sitting there for about three hours, we were talking about the region, security issues in the region. When I left the United States, 
Tunisia was in protest. But even I, who keep a good eye on the media, even I didn't think that anything significant is going to develop out of those protests, I must confess. I've seen so many bread riots in Tunisia, so many bread riots in Algeria. Tunisians and Algerians uh, have always been rioting as long as I remember, and nothing comes of it, right? So I was not aware of developments. Plus, that's not even my area of speciality. Uh, so I don't look at it that carefully. So we're sitting there at al ghad over breakfast for three hours. We're talking about a whole range of issues. The first major preoccupation around the breakfast table was the Iranian nuclear possibility. The Arabs are scared of the, of the Iranians. A lot of discussion about that. Then also about Hezbollah, who has moved into a hegemonic position in dictating the politics of Lebanon. More scary because you can understand the narrative now. It's what Arabs are concerned about, the Shiite crescent, right? Then was talking about other kinds of issues, not a peep about Tunisia. It was not even on the radar. By the time we get to the airport Saturday morning, we are surprised to watch on the, on, on the television screens that Ben Ali is on his way to Saudi Arabia. In other words, these developments have even these regimes who have the most advanced muhabarat, intelligence services, and very brutal, even they were caught unawares, or unless Turki al-Faisal and other people around the table were just very poorly informed, like the times that we were also poorly informed. So I think that some of these issues are, are, are very vital to understand, that these have been boiling for some time and surprise the people in the region as well as surprise the world. But the, I think there's a passion and a determination to take leadership into their own hands, to own their own societies, and something that we have unable to get our heads around that as, as Americans and trying to understand developments elsewhere. So we, even our academic studies of those societies are kind of a, a patrimonial and a paternalistic understanding of what can they do, what will we allow them to do in terms of our interests. And I think that's problematic and flawed in our, in our examination. The last thing, and I'm saying very briefly about this, is that last week we saw on last Thursday Peter King holding uh, congressional hearings about radicalism within American Muslim society, the whole Muslim society. So we've already seen since the uh, attempt to build the, the proposal for the mosque and uh, near Ground Zero um, uh, uh, last summer, and we saw a great deal of anger against Islam and Muslims for building the mosque, right? Um, there were ideas that were circulated that the only thing that Muslims, why they should not have the mosque, because Muslims like to build a victory mosque after they've done some kind of, inflicted some damage, they want to build a victory mosque. So this is the victory mosque, should not allow them to have it. That is what Pam Geller was saying, right? And that's what Fox was telling you. And even spilled onto other, on, onto other kind of media channels. Thank God that we had a sane mayor in, in New York in the form of uh, uh, Michael Bloomberg that stood out and stood up for principle. But also, what we also heard that Islam is not a religion. Islam is not a, it's an ideology that wants to take over America and replace the Constitution with the Sharia. That is the narrative. And that narrative is the prepackaged narrative of which things are just to be built in. Therefore, you've seen what's been happening to attempts to build mosques or altar mosques in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, or the, uh, in Oklahoma, they've taken resolutions that nothing concerning the Sharia would be permissible uh, in any form of, in any court or legislation in Oklahoma. Well, I must say that it seems that Oklahoma is insisting in isolating itself because there are Muslims there. They're going to go to the courts with their Sharia agreements that they have, and the courts will have to address it. I don't know how they're going to address it, but they've just put themselves into a, a very difficult position. The question here is that some of these have baked ideas about Islam, have been put into circulation post 9-11 in the spirit of know your enemy. And this has been happening underground. There's not much visibility, but this has been happening on the internet, on the blogosphere, in very, very interesting ways. And especially extreme versions of evangelical Christians have been doing this kind of work. So say, we need to know you, you need to know your enemies, so when you meet Muslims, you can give them this half-baked half information. I don't know how many of you have seen a video called the, uh, the Muslim, the, um, Muslim Demographics. It's on YouTube. When I looked at the two years ago, that thing had about 60 or 70,000 hits. Right now, it's over 2 million hits. The Muslim demographic is a scary video. You look at that and you see that they show by year 2025, Europe will be Islamic. France is going to go first, then Germany, then Britain. 
and America by the year 2050, America is going to be all Muslim. So that really, and that has gone, that has gone viral, so to speak, and really is working on people's anxieties. And therefore, people are not even talking back, but people are just going silent because there is some truth about all this danger about Islam. There is some truth. So even moderates would keep quiet because they don't even know how to respond or they have believed some of these things. The other thing is that, that the, the narrative that is being put out there is very powerful of the, by the types of a woman by the name of Bridget, Gil, uh, Bridget, uh, um, Gil, uh, Bridget from Lebanon, or Ayan Hershey Ali, uh, a woman does not even claim to be a Muslim, but she has become an expert on Islam without any qualification. Um, I mean, it'd be surprising that one would find, a see, on a US TV channel, someone like, say, David Irving being invited, who's a Holocaust denier, to talk about Judaism. It will not be possible. But it's perfectly OK to bring Ayan Hershey Ali, an Islam denier, to come talk about Islam. That is perfectly possible. Um, and while we have an immense amount of talent in the United States to talk about these things, I always say that the United States, in terms of a country in the West, we possibly have the best literary resources on Islam if you take just three universities, University of Chicago, Princeton, and Harvard's libraries. And we have te technical expertise about Islam and different Muslim societies to, to very, very high level uh, of perfection and, and, and qualification. But all that knowledge is locked up and never used by the larger public or is never, never, never filters down into policy making. I think I will stop right there because there will be opportunity to say th further things. But just one more thing I will say, and that is that having said all this, there's also a serious problem within many, many Muslim societies that complicates the story and the inability of Muslims finding some kind of imagination for Islamic reform. How to deal with Islam as a religious tradition and its encounters with the modern world. That is a issue that Muslims have been battling with for the last 200 years and more intensely in the last, in the last, in the last century. In places like Pakistan, what you see more, we don't see some of those efforts in order to deal with the real life issues of the questions of Muslim societies on questions of theology and Islamic law. And hence, we only see the pathologies of that society manifesting itself. But it's not only, I don't want to dump, only want to dump on Pakistan, but this is also prevalent in other places. And hence, we need to pay attention to that. And I think the more we as a public keep ourselves informed about those developments, understand those, those developments with a certain amount of more than superficial depth, we will also get a sense of how to deal with those questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ibrahim. You've given us a lot to think about, and I'm sure there'll be many questions for you um, in a little bit. But first, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our second distinguished speaker, uh, Ahmad Rashid. Um, his background is quite different. Of course, he has academic training, um, uh, some of it in his native Pakistan at Government College University in Lahore, but also at Cambridge University. But uh, he is certainly the best known, and in my opinion, simply the best. Uh, journalist working on uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan and Central Asia uh, today and has for some time been that. Um, he writes currently for many publications, Financial Times, The National Interest, New York Review of Books, BBC Online, Wall Street Journal, uh, and a number of uh, academic and foreign affairs journals. He was for 22 years the Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Central Asia correspondent for the Far Eastern Economic Review. Um, he writes also, too, for the International Herald Tribune. He lectures very widely, including in Chicago, we're happy to say, um, and was the first journalist to address the UN General Assembly in New York and the first journalist to address NATO ambassadors in Brussels. So he has a very distinguished uh, record in that respect. Um, He's written a number of very important books, um, uh, a wonderful one which I read quite a few years ago called Taliban, which I recommend very highly. Uh, he has written one called Jihad, The Rise of Militant Islam in Central Asia. Um, and he has another one called Descent into Chaos, U.S. Policy and the Failure of Nation Building in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Central Asia. Um, he has decades of experience, unrivaled experience in this part of the world 
knows the issues, I would say, inside out, knows all of the, and has interviewed, I think, probably all of the key players in the region, I think, including Osama bin Laden, although not very recently. I think that was uh, maybe 25 years ago. Um, but uh, he has just uh, an incredible um, familiarity and awareness of the region and an ability to analyze it also in his writings, which is really quite remarkable. So uh, we're glad to welcome him today. And uh, would you like to speak from there or from here? From here, OK. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that introduction. That was um, very kind of you. And thank you all of you for coming. Um, I'm going to try and you know, talk about Pakistan and Afghanistan and um, uh, end with, uh, with Al-Qaeda. So um, we have quite a big agenda. The, the, the situation in Pakistan these days is extremely tense. As you know, we've had the assassination of two senior government officials. Uh, by extremists, um, and um, uh, there is a now a very strong um, and powerful extremist movement which is genuinely trying to topple the state and the government. And um, it, is, it is united around um, several issues that unfortunately are bringing more and more people from the center, that is the silent majority, who are, by, who are not extremists at all, but bringing them into the movement. The first issue is the blasphemy law. Uh, uh, amending the, um, uh, the blasphemy law, which has been immensely controversial. B and um, uh, I won't go into that in any great detail, but let me just say that even though the government and the military have completely backtracked on any kind of changes to the blasphemy law, the extremists are still assassinating people who might have called for amendment at some stage. Um, the, the second issue is growing anti-Americanism. Uh, which has been exacerbated by the arrest of the, this Ray Davis, uh, the CIA agent who um, killed two Pakistanis, an American vehicle uh, killed another Pakistani, um, and, and, and uh, he's in jail in Lahore at the moment, and that remains a, 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 a very big kind of mobilizing factor. It's kind of focused a lot of people on, um, on, on strong anti-Americanism, which was already very prevalent in society. And the third is the crashing economy in the country. Um, we are going through an, a, a very deep economic crisis, 20% inflation, there, there's no electricity, there's no gas, there's a huge energy crisis, there's no investment, the IMF has just suspended all, all loans to us. Um, and, and the fundamentalists are able to um, uh, mobilize, uh, to first criticize and then mobilize the ruling elite um, for incompetence, corruption, mismanagement, etc. And much of their criticism is correct, but it's, it's instead of being made by the secular parties or by the uh, mainstream political parties, it's being made by the extremists. Now, how, do, how, you know, how did we get to um, this very delicate situation that we're in now? Well, um, first of all, let me, you know, let me just go very briefly back to um, uh, the Afghan war in, in the 1980s. The U.S. gave $6 billion for aid to the Afghan Mujahideen, which was all channeled through the Pakistan Army and the intelligence services, the ISI. And um, Pakistan at that time was ruled by a military dictator, Zia al Haq, who, who had Islamic, um, who, who wanted to change uh, the, the state into becoming a, a liberal democracy, into becoming an Islamic state. And much of that money was channeled to the extremist Mujahideen groups who were fighting the Soviets at that time with the excuse that they were the best fighters and they were killing the most Russians, although that was not true. Uh, these groups included Golbadin Hikmatyar's group, um, Abdul Rasul Sayaf's group, etc. And these groups were then also linked by the military and by the intelligence services with Pakistani uh, religious parties. Um, uh, at that time, there were no real Pakistani militant groups, but the mainstream religious parties that had taken part in the democratic process in, uh, in, in, in earlier decades um, became the, the sponsors for these, Af for these extremist Afghan Mujahideen groups. So you immediately have now a linkage between extremism, if you like, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. 
And in the 90s, what happens, exactly the same thing happens with the groups, uh, with the Kashmiris. Um, uh, but as you know, Kashmir has been the main uh, um, um, uh, 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 issue between India and Pakistan. It's an unresolved issue since partition. Uh, uh, several wars have been fought between the two countries on Kashmir. Uh, and Pakistan has done a, a, a great deal to try and mobilize um, the Kashmiris um, uh, against India. What happens in the 90s is that there is an uprising in Kashmir, which is an indigenous uprising against Indian rule. And again, a lot of the fighters coming out of uh, 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 Pakistani fighters and groups coming out of Afghanistan um, uh, become involved in Kashmir and uh, set up militant groups um, based in Pakistan, which then start supporting and uh, ideologizing the Kashmiri movement. The Kashmiri movement in the early 90s was a movement largely for independence from India. Uh, or separatism from India, separatists from India. Um, it becomes, by the mid-90s, a jihadi movement, um, which is dominated by uh, Pakistani groups. Um, by now, Pakistani militant groups have formed who help the Kashmiris, and at the same time are now helping the Taliban government, which has taken power in Afghanistan. Um, so in the 90s, you, you have an extension of these jihadi groups being able to, with the support of the military and the intelligence services, um, and they are supporting it because for, for them, keeping India at bay, keeping India out of Afghanistan, keeping India um, tied up in Kashmir so that you know, half a million Indian troops have to be used to, to quell the uprising in Kashmir, it becomes a kind of uh, national security issue. And, so, but it is the extremists who take advantage of this and are able then to create international links with the Afghans, with the Kashmiris, and finally, of course, with Al-Qaeda. Um, now, what happens there is that most of um, uh, 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 Al-Qaeda, uh, of course, uh, Osama bin Laden fought against the Soviets. He then um, he, he went away to Sudan, but he came back. He had he had very close links with a lot of these Islamic groups in Pakistan, and he then moves to Afghanistan in '96, where uh, Pakistani groups renew their contacts with him, work for him, um, and hundreds and several thousand Arabs come to Afghanistan to fight for the Taliban via Pakistan. And it is these Islamic groups in Pakistan who facilitate that movement of Arabs and all sorts of other nationalities into. Um, so what I'm what simply I'm trying to say is that we have is uh, uh, an Islamic movement in Pakistan that has been nurtured uh, uh, by uh, outsiders, but also by the military and the intelligence in Pakistan. And unfortunately, when we've had civilian governments, as we did in the 90s, where we went back to democracy, Ziaul Haq was killed, we went, we went back to a series of um, civilian governments, civilian governments have not been able to confront the military um, over this issue. Uh, the civilian governments have always been weak, they've always backtracked on, even though they have wanted a foreign policy that was friendly with India, friendly with Afghanistan, curbing extremism, they have never been able to exert enough authority or um, carry the weight of, um, uh, uh, of being able to change foreign policy. So the army has dominated um, national security policy and foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the region and the neighborhood. Now, what we get after 9-11 is a basically a continuation. Pakistan does a U-turn uh, right after 9-11. It promises Bush that you know, we will hunt down Al-Qaeda. You can use Pakistan as a base to attack Afghanistan and, and, and root out Al-Qaeda. But what happens after the war ends is that all the groups who were in Afghanistan and survived came and took refuge in Pakistan. And by then, the groups included not just Al-Qaeda, they included the, Af the entire Afghan Taliban leadership, um, they included Central Asian groups, particularly the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan and other affiliated groups. They included uh, Chechen groups and, and groups from the Caucasus. And they included odd-bod Islamists from, from Bosnia, from the Philippines, from Indonesia, all sorts of people. So Pakistan, if you like, becomes the sanctuary for a variety of, of the, 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 the uh, remains of what is left in Afghanistan after the American attack and the American bombing. And these groups are given shelter 
Um, in the uh, Pashtun areas, uh, we should remember that most of the Taliban belong to the Pashtun ethnic group in Afghanistan. Um, and they're given shelter in the Pashtun areas because um, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, Al-Qaeda pays enormous sums of money for, for this sanctuary. Um, the Pashtuns in Pakistan, the Pakistani Pashtuns, have already been fighting in Afghanistan in the 80s and 90s alongside the Mujahideen and alongside the Taliban. So there's a natural affinity for the Pashtuns to give shelter to these people. And the deal struck between Bush and Musharraf essentially was, we again have a military dictatorship in Pakistan. Um, and the deal essentially struck between Musharraf and, and Bush was that um, you, Mr. Musharraf, go after Al-Qaeda. Our target is Al-Qaeda. We really don't care what happens to the Taliban. We consider them as defeated, as, uh, as of no interest to US national security. So what happens is that Pakistan facilitates this. It goes after Al-Qaeda. It catches hundreds of Al-Qaeda people who end up in Guantanamo and all the rest of it. And the rest of the um, uh, the Taliban and all these other groups are able to survive and thrive in, in Pakistan. And over time, what we have is that these um, uh, foreign, particularly Al-Qaeda, these foreign groups, exert enormous influence amongst the Pakistani Pashtuns and radicalize them. And there's a process of radicalization, which I go into, you know, in, in Descent into Chaos, that happens. Um, but by 2006, 2007, you have full, a full-fledged Pakistani Taliban movement in the um, tribal areas and the Pashtun belt of Pakistan, which is, which is, first of all, helping the Afghan Taliban fight the Americans in um, Afghanistan, but uh, at the same time is also now fighting the Pakistan army and is trying to overthrow the state. And as you know, we've had this horrendous uh, last two or three years of battling, the suicide bombings, attacks on the military, on civilian targets, on um, all sorts of things. So we now have an indigenous Pakistani Taliban movement um, which is, is fighting both the Americans and is fighting the Pakistan state. And what happens um, uh, uh, in the last two or three years is that this essentially Taliban movement, which is again based on the Pakistani Pashtuns, links up with these other groups who've been fighting in Kashmir and fighting against India. And these groups are based in Karachi, in Punjab, all over the country. And they, they have their recruitment from all over the country. And um, uh, a lot of them have, have, have come out of the uh, madrasas that you've just heard about. Um, and, but, but a lot of them are urban, um, semi-educated, um, semi-employed, semi-unemployed um, uh, young men who, who bring, of course, enormous uh, abilities because these are not uneducated tribesmen. These are urban, um, urban young people who are able to carry out attacks in the urban areas for the first time. And there is this um, alliance now between these Pakistani militant groups um, in the cities uh, and in, in, um, all, all across Pakistan with the Pakistani Taliban. And this, this forms a very lethal combination because you have um, uh, both the Pashtun population and you've got groups which are um, embedded in other ethnic groups in Punjab, in Sindh, and even in Balochistan linking up and joining um, together. So, um, this is, this is the situation in Pakistan. Now, uh, uh, what has been the government reaction to this? Well, uh, we had a military regime until uh, 2007, 2008, when Musharraf is ousted. Um, Musharraf really plays it. Um, uh, 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 he, he keeps his dual track policy going. He wants to promote the fundamentalists because that is um, his um, you know, answer to uh, the dangers posed by India. To, the, uh, to Pakistan. This has been part of Pakistan's national security policy for all these years. Um, and, he, and, and But then in 2004, 2005, just before um, he's ousted, um, he starts a dialogue with India, uh, which never reaches fruition. But part of that dialogue is, an, is, an, is a promise by Musharraf to curb these Pakistani militant groups from going into Kashmir um, and, and encouraging um, the Kashmiris to fight. But by the time Musharraf goes, these militant groups have been told to sit quiet um, for a year or two. They're deeply frustrated. And naturally, many of these militant groups become, um, uh, go off to fight for the Taliban and then become you know, anti-state. 
So this is the situation in, in Pakistan right now, where we have a, a, a merging of um, uh, all the various militant groups um, who are now uh, basically opposed to the state um, and are able to mobilize, uh, are trying to mobilize a wider public yeah, and you know, it, it must be said that uh, fundamentalism in Pakistan has never uh, drawn more than um, eight to ten percent of the, of the voting public. It has never been a, um, a, a, a it has never drawn mass popularity, you know, amongst the uh, the, uh, the public. We remain a, um, a a state that still you know uh, favors democracy, elections, um, and all the sort of patronage and all the rest of it that goes along alongside those. Um, uh, uh, political norms, um, but but for the first time, I think you know the country now is really threatened, um, and the problem is that both the government and the army are feeling extremely nervous and are not willing to stand up to this threat, um, not just on the blasphemy issue, but frankly on 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 other issues, um, especially the territorial space that now uh, these fundamentalist groups are occupying. Uh, in the northwest of the country and in other parts of the country, um, these fundamentalists are, are managing to um, uh, 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 undermine the state, undermine the police, the bureaucracy, the administration, um, undermine the economy, of course, because who's going to invest in a, in a, in a, in a situation um, like this? So um, we are now in a, what I would call, in a very dire uh, situation. Um, and uh, it, it, it it is not being helped by uh, what is happening in Afghanistan. Now, in, in Afghanistan, simply, um, I, I'm not going to go into the, uh, into the whole history, and I don't have time for that, but, but, but let me briefly say, um, I think you know, you, the Americans have been in Afghanistan now for 10, nearly 11 years. And um, the promises that were made by Bush and by the Western Alliance to rebuild the country after 30 years of war, um, to create a minimal, and I will use the word minimal, Afghan state, so that it could function as a country, as it did function in the 70s. Afghanistan, contrary to all this belief that Afghanistan never had a state, it was never centralized, um, it did have a government and state, it was a monarchy, and it had a minimal economy and a minimal state um, uh, uh, authority, which did keep the peace for something like uh, 70 years. And um, uh, this is before the Soviet invasion. And frankly, in the last 10 years, um, uh, the, the, with the American and NATO um, uh, presence and occupation, if you like, in Afghanistan, it has not even been able to replicate the Afghan state as it existed in the 70s. We still don't even have a basic Afghan economy, an indigenous Afghan economy, which, which could be at least as much as the economy was in the 70s. And you can imagine what the economy was in the 70s. It was a minimalist economy. The Afghans didn't starve to death. They, they grew enough food for themselves, and they exported a tiny amount which supplied enough income for them to, run to, 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 um, uh, to make the state function. But we've not even been... So the lack of rebuilding that has happened in Afghanistan um, uh, has unfortunately been tragic. Now, um, uh, President Obama has come in with the promise that he will do the right thing in Afghanistan, and certainly there's been a huge American surge in troops, in money, in civilian advisors, in a desire uh, to, to, to rebuild the country. Um, in a, again, in a minimal way. Um, and now, as you know, with, with, uh, with 150,000 American and NATO troops there, um, they are, uh, they've announced that they are going to start a, uh, a gradual withdrawal and what is being called a transition uh, towards full Afghan control by 20, uh, 2014. Now, frankly, um, um, I'm extremely skeptical about this because uh, in the midst of, and, and, and in the meantime, what has happened is, of course, that the Taliban were rejuvenated in 2003. They relaunched their offensive. This was partly done as a result with, with help from some of these militant groups who were living in Pakistan, with the help of the Pakistani Taliban, with the help of al-Qaeda. But it was also done um, with the help of the Pakistani military and the Pakistani intelligence services. Now, their bone of contention with the Americans were several. They thought that the government in Kabul was anti-Pakistan. They thought the Indians um, had come in too strongly into Afghanistan, and they were against that. So there was clandestine support by Musharraf for a Taliban um, revival. And of course, we, know, we now know that this Taliban revival started in 
um, a couple of provinces in the south, the Taliban heartland, and has now basically spread to the entire country. And the problem now for the Americans is how do you transition in the midst of a civil war and, a ma and an insurgency? You cannot lay the foundations, even the, with all the best of intentions that this um, uh, Obama administration has, you cannot lay the foundations for a bureaucracy, a justice system, a, a minimal, a, a, a decent army, police, etc., um, in the midst of a civil war. And that's why I think it has become now essential that if the Americans are to withdraw in good order and leave something functioning behind, there has to be a dialogue with the Taliban. The Taliban have already expressed a desire to talk to the Americans. Um, and there is some kind of dialogue going on, as you may have read about. But what is needed is, a, um, I think, a, a, a different direction for the United States um, to have a dialogue with the Taliban, a reduction of the violence, a reduction um, you know, in, in the insurgency, so that some of these governmental institutions can be built. Now, there are an enormous amount of other problems, which I won't go into, the corruption of the Karzai government the incompetence of the Karzai government. Um, but that goes two ways. I think it goes, you know, um, yes, um, uh, Afghanistan is, being, is still dominated by warlords and drug lords and all the rest of it. But part of that is because the Americans allowed that to happen after 9-11 because of the focus on Iraq, because there was no investment in Afghanistan. So the first thing is that, you know, I think... Uh, um, uh, we need to talk to the Taliban, and we need to take that forward, and we need to use these three years in a more productive fashion. Um, the Taliban cannot be beaten. There is no military victory um, uh, in sight, um, uh, because as and 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 there is no um, uh, uh, ability of the Americans, it seems, to be able to deal with this issue of the sanctuary um, in Pakistan that the Taliban have. And as long as they have that sanctuary with this vast reservoir of Pakistani Pashtuns and Pakistani militants who are willing to fight in Afghanistan, um, this war is not winnable in a, in a military sense um, of the word. Now, the other part of this is, of course, the conundrum in Afghanistan, is that Afghanistan is a landlocked nation with seven neighbors. And in the 90s, all of these neighbors fueled the civil war in Afghanistan. The Pakistanis backed the Taliban along with the Saudis. Um, Russia, India, Iran backed uh, what was then called the Northern Alliance, the non-Pashtuns, that is the Tajiks, Uzbeks, uh, Turkomans, Hazaras, and other ethnic groups. And the fear is that there is already a lot of regional competition and tension, which f the Bush administration did very little to tame. And what is happening now is that you have, as this, as this drawdown be begins, all the neighbors are again galvanizing to, to have their influence and say in Afghanistan. Pakistan of course, is clandestinely wanting a, 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 a Taliban government or a Taliban sharing of power with Karzai in Kabul. Iran and India and Russia and the Central Asian states are dead against it and will sabotage it or will resist it. So what the Americans also need is a major diplomatic effort to try and bring the region together, which is a very tall order right now because you have enormous tensions between India and Pakistan, between Pakistan and Iran. Nobody talks to Iran anyway because of you know, the other issues that, that underlie US relations with Iran. So, um, but nevertheless, I think that um, a, a, a more reasonable settlement of Afghanistan needs a dialogue with the Taliban, needs rebuilding of the Afghan state, and needs, for, and, 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 and needs for the Taliban to be bought into some kind of power-sharing agreement. Now, I think the Taliban themselves, the Afghan Taliban, are moving, ha have moved from a position of seeking support from al-Qaeda, being you know, um, very sympathetic to al-Qaeda, to becoming much more nationalistic. The Afghan Taliban have never supported global jihad. None of the training that you know, has happened for some, you know, the bomber of Times Square or uh, the, the, the bombers in, in, in London or in, in parts of Europe that have, that have happened, all of that training has really been carried out largely by, in Pakistan by the Pakistani Taliban. The Afghan Taliban have not been part of any kind of global jihad or the laying of bombs in Europe or America or, or, or anyone else, or anywhere else. And I think, you know, they are in a more um, uh, 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 
They see themselves more as nationalists. They are jihadists. They are fighting what they see as a foreign occupation of their country as they fought the Soviet Union. Um, but at the same time, they're not interested in spreading their revolution um, um, outside uh, the borders. Now, let me just briefly end um, with, with, um, al uh, with Al-Qaeda. The tragedy of all this neglect in Afghanistan and Pakistan by, uh, by the Bush administration um, and, and the, the uh, refusal to talk to um, some of these Islamic groups who may be amenable to dialogue, like the Afghan Taliban today, in my opinion, has led to, contrary to what most people are, are telling, especially American pundits on Al-Qaeda are saying that Al-Qaeda is finished, it's, it's all over. Um, in my opinion, Al-Qaeda has actually spread far more since 9-11 than it ever had in, in, uh, before 9-11. Al-Qaeda today has, a cells, has cells in every European country. You've seen Al-Qaeda attacks in places that you could never even dream of, like Sweden and Denmark. And um, of course, there's, a, there's a, a, a still a very big Al-Qaeda presence in Britain, in Germany. The French are worried. The Italians are worried. Uh, a very big Al-Qaeda cell was uh, made up of Arabs and Pakistanis was busted in Barcelona um, last year. So you have, but Al-Qaeda is not the same thing it was before 9-11. It is no longer an orga a single organization. And Al-Qaeda uh, has been defined in many different ways. It's an idea. It's an ideology. It's a, it's a website. Um, it's, a, uh, it's an organization. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's a franchise. You can become a member of Al-Qaeda by, you know, as, as Zarqawi did in Iraq. You know, he said, I want to rename my group. You know, I'm fighting the Americans. I want to rename my group as the Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And, and he was given permission to do so, even though bin Laden and Zawari had nothing to do with what was going on, or very little to do with what was going on in Iraq. So Al-Qaeda has, you know, I, I, cannot, def I cannot define Al-Qaeda with one single definition. But I would agree with all these definitions. It is all these things and, and possibly more, even. So it is not something that is going to go away um, uh, in, uh, uh, in a hurry. And yes, it, it, it certainly poses a threat. Now, you know, many of these sort of loner attacks that we've seen, for example, uh, the boy who tried to bomb, um, the Pakistani guy who tried to bomb Times Square. Now, I mean, he was trained actually by the Pakistani Taliban. And he was very keen to emulate. A lot of this is emulation. You know, we want to emulate Al-Qaeda. Or we want to become, uh, we want to be honored by Al-Qaeda. So if we lay down this bomb, Al-Qaeda will, will raise us in its pantheon of heroes and martyrs you know, uh, uh, for, for jihad. So the Al-Qaeda threat is very there, it is, is very much there. But at the same time, I think um, this, you know, Obama has made huge uh, strides with the Cairo speech and all that, trying to reach out to the Muslim world. But until we've had, until this Arab uprising, we've not really seen any measures being taken by the US government to actually um, improve relations um, and to try and differentiate between what is Al-Qaeda and global jihad and what is increasingly becoming um, uh, many of these Islamic groups who today are you know, part of the terrorist list in, 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 in the State Department, many of these groups are becoming what I would call not global jihadists but nationalist Islamists. And, 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 and this is a phenomenon that we are going to have to live with and we are going to have to accept. As, as, as being part of the political framework in many of these countries. Now, um, Hamas, for example, the Palestinian Hamas is condemned as a, as a terrorist group by the US. Uh, but millions of Palestinians don't. And until there's going to be a resolution of, of, of redefining Hamas, you're not going to get any kind of Israeli-Palestinian settlement. You're not even going to get unity within the Palestinians. So, um, uh, yes, Hezbollah is part of a big power play by Iran in the Middle East, and that is this tension that you know, Ibrahim talked about between the Arabs and Iran. Um, but at the same time, Hezbollah sees itself as, a, um, uh, as the, you know, the uh, opposition to Israel, but also as a nationalist um, Lebanese party, which is justified in, in wanting to increase its influence um, in Lebanon. So I think you know, we, we have to evolve a, a, um, uh, the United States and NATO and Europe 
has to evolve a strategy in coming years where the real Al-Qaeda, the real terrorists, the real people who want to target civilians anywhere in the world and want to kill um, uh, Muslims and non-Muslims uh, for, this, for this very vague concept of global jihad, those have to be isolated. And, and groups who do want to come into the, um, uh, into the mainstream, I think there has to be a much more nuanced policy um, towards them. I think the, uh, the, the, what is happening in the Arab world is, 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 is incredibly positive, but I do not see Al-Qaeda leaving, uh, leaving these countries alone. Remember that Egypt has been um, the heartland and the originator of um, Islamic fundamentalism. It, it started the whole Islamic anti-colonial Islamic uh, uh, movement in the 1920s, and it has since then it has bred many um, extremist groups, uh, such as uh, uh, Emin al Zawari, who, who um, uh, uh, led one of the major Islamic groups before it was cracked down. The difference in the Arab world has been that the dictators in the Arab world, yes, were dictators, but, but they completely crushed any Islamic opposition. So that is why, I mean, and they crushed, of course, democratic opposition. So you have this in, uh, leadership vacuum in Tunisia, in Egypt, and, and hopefully in Libya once, you know, if, if, if Gaddafi goes. You do not have um, these Islamic groups having any presence. But certainly they are going to try and make a comeback. Al-Qaeda is certainly going to try and make a comeback. And I fear very much that Al-Qaeda is going to use issues, for example, um, uh, the tensions between the Copts and uh, the Muslims in Egypt. It's going to use uh, uh, Shia Sunni tensions in other Arab countries as, as, as a wedge to try and make their way um, back in. But I think, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that, you know, Egypt, the Egyptians have shown such incredible maturity in this movement. Um, that they're going to continue on the path towards democracy and towards um, uh, stabilizing their country. But certainly, you know, Al-Qaeda is not going to um, uh, give up there. So I'm, I'm, it, it becomes even more, with this Arab uprising, it becomes even more important that the U.S. adopts a far more nuanced understanding of what is happening in the Muslim world rather than this blanket that we've had of that, you know, uh, uh, everybody's a terrorist and um, everybody's anti-Western and everybody's supporting global jihad. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, we have time for questions from the audience. I, I think I will exploit my position as uh, moderator to ask a question of my own to start it off and give you a chance to formulate your own. And I'd actually like to pose this to both of our speakers, but focus it particularly on Pakistan, which uh, Mr. Rashid um, uh, alerted us to the really dangerous situation in Pakistan today. And my question, I guess, is a simple one. And like simple questions, it probably doesn't have a simple answer. But uh, what Given the dangerous situation in Pakistan, what would you recommend or what would you hope or what you think might help in terms of a, a single or a policy measure that the United States government could make and that the Pakistani government could make? What, what could they do? Is there something they could do that would uh, hopefully uh, improve the situation or put it somewhat on a better path or start it on a better path? <laughs> you can continue. Well, I think you know several things have to be done simultaneously. Um, I think there has to be an Indo, uh, an India-Pakistan rapprochement. Uh, the Indians have been incredibly stubborn in in really not understanding the crisis that Pakistan is in. It would not suit India to see a meltdown and a collapse and a state failure in Pakistan at all. Um, uh, I think the Indians have to be much more flexible and accommodating. At the same time, I think there has to be a, a some kind of political deal in Afghanistan with the Taliban. That would certainly take a, a, a major part of the fundamentalist, it would uh, demoralize and perhaps weaken the fundamentalist movement in Pakistan uh, enormously if the Afghan Taliban were to seek some kind of rapprochement with Karzai, and that was backed by the Americans and the international community. Um, I think at the same time, uh, Pakistan needs economic support. And that is a very tall order today, given your own economic problems and Europe's economic problems. It's very difficult asking um, uh, you know, the West uh, for economic support. 
Um, but thirdly, I think, you know, civilian rule, despite the backtracking by the civilian government and the incompetence of the civilian government, we, uh, the, the military, a military coup, military rule, martial law, you know, we, we, we've had half our time, uh, half our time as a nation has been spent under the military. It is absolutely no answer. Um, we, you know, whatever can be done to strengthen um, uh, uh, the civilian government should be done. And, and finally, I think, you know, um, what has also happened is that fledg the fledgling civil society that exists in Pakistan has been totally cowered by these assassinations. Um, and there is a fledgling civil society. The middle class, the NGOs, the media, um, uh, human rights groups, uh, uh, development groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, they have been very cowed, and they need to be, um, uh, uh, you know, helped. They need to be supported. Uh, they need to be again a a a a a more nuanced understanding of the problems in Pakistan. Thank you. Let me give a shot at, and, and I think uh, Ahmed has given the um, the kind of more global thing. I, I think that there's something that from someone who studies Pakistan remotely or certain aspects of Pakistani society. I, I would say that given the fact that Pakistan is now, there's an umbilical cord of violence connecting Afghanistan to Pakistan, which is not stoppable, that the stability of Pakistan in some ways is dependent on the stability on, on Afghanistan. And I think both are now connected at the, at the, at the naval. Um, I think that one of the things that I, and the more I think about this issue and, and Pakistan is in the news all the time. I mean, in fact, uh, suicide bombings in Pakistan has become a kind of a, such a regular phenomenon, hardly gets regularly reported now in our media. Um, I would like to see, you know, more, and I agree with the fact of support of Pakistan's elites, its, its middle class, its NGOs, its fledgling civil society. But uh, I keep on asking, where is this fledge, where is the civil society, and when is it gonna take its country back? And, and, I'm, you know, and I think the next thing I'm going to say is going to make many people nervous <laughs> because I think that one of the things I think everybody in Washington, London, uh, and Berlin and other places and, and Paris are fearing that you have an Egypt-style uprising in Pakistan because the first concern is going to be with that kind of uprising, Lashkar Taiba is going to take over which is, or, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Taliban are going to take over. So that should not be allowed to happen in Pakistan. But, and, and I think that's what most people's fear is because then, and Pakistan is also a nuclear power, so then the nuclear power will really be in the hands of, quote unquote, terrorists, because these are terrorist groups. So I think that's the one nightmare scenario that, that people are trying to avoid. But if, that, if the, the moderate Pakistani elite and, and those that fledging to civil society is not gonna prepare to take the risks because right now, to talk about any kind of issue means a bullet in your head. And the state is too weak to defend that. So there will have to be a counterweight to the militants. And I don't know how one configures that, but the other way that you can have it, you can have a progressive militant group that does that. But I don't want to advocate civil war in Pakistan, uh, which is already happening. But I think one side is getting clobbered, and the other side is on the offensive. And, and that is the difficulty. The other question, I think, is that the national dialogue about religion, which is my area, in Pakistan is not happening. And Pakistan's elites are being cowered by the religious dial by the, by the loud voices of extreme religious voices and not getting the middle, even amongst the traditionalists, and not giving them the, the kinds of kind of support that they need. So in some ways, the fledgling civil society needs to make some kind of alliance with moderate religion that will be your bulwark against extremist religion. A very, very important, for instance, religious voice in Pakistan is a man called Javed Ahmad Ghamidi, who's based in Lahore. He's had so many threats to his life that he's now in exile, in self-imposed exile in Malaysia. He doesn't come to Pakistan. Um, people like Taki Usmani, important voices of a certain kind of moderate, moderate Islam, they don't even talk anymore because if they say anything, they will also get the bullet. So I think Pakistan is in a really catch-22 situation, but I think it's not. The last thing I would say is that at the, at the level of the blogosphere, in the digital sphere, there's a certain kind of chatter going on that not too many people are paying attention to that. And that is 
But I've seen it, and I think uh, Senator Kerry has picked up on it, that this whole question of, and given the kind of confusing nature of Pakistan's intelligence agency and the army and the intelligence agency sympathies for a certain kind of radical Islam, that creates a situation that the, the, the kind of situation in which Davis is right now, and Davis being attacked by two people on a motorcycle, as, as, as the Americans claim, and then he shot those two people and so on. Right now, in the blogosphere and elsewhere, and in protests in Pakistan, there's a linkage made that Davis's release is contingent on Afia Siddiqui, who is a woman who, who lived in America, who was then uh, um, uh, went to Pakistan, was hijacked, in, uh, by, kidnapped by Pakistan intelligence in Pakistan, taken to Afghanistan, spent five years in a, in a, in a dark hole, and the release on the streets of Ghazni, and then rearrested and the charge that she tried to shoot an American serviceman, brought, uh, wounded to America, was tried here and given a long sentence. So there's this kind of linkage going on, and I think people they have expressed that kind of question that the only way that you're gonna get Davis is if there's the release of Afia Siddiqui. So there's a whole web of activities going on that uh, is difficult to fathom, but that is the ground reality in Pakistan. I think the religious discourse and getting serious religious uh, discourse into the, in, in, into the equation will take Pakistan in some way, but not depending too much on that also because there's other issues that are involved, but I think it will help in lowering the, the temperature. Thank you very much. We have microphones uh, on the side. Uh, people will bring them to you if you have a question, so please, questions. Yes, sir. Well, I had the, uh, this is a question directed more towards um, Mr. Um, Rashid, but I'd be happy if the other uh, professor would join in too. I had the pleasure of learning some things in one of his books, um, Central uh, Jihad, not Jihad, um, Jihad, that uh, a lot of facts that weren't really um, accessible in the newspapers, and I think some of these facts a lot of Americans didn't know. Uh, for example, uh, Mr. Musharraf said in June of 2001 that he saw no point in supporting the non-Pashtun interests in Afghanistan because they were, they were irrelevant to Pakistan's interests in Afghanistan, that he would stand behind the Taliban. And that struck me because, well, for physical reasons, it was three months before September 11th. And so, um, right after September 11th, you said in your book as well as today that Pakistan did a U-turn and promised that they would pursue the Taliban and support the United States against extreme terrorism. And so this, for, with this foundation, um, you, why is it that we went along so much thinking that Pakistan was going to cooperate with us when you gave so many vivid examples that they, they might have co cooperated with us in some ways, in other ways they haven't. And so now we've reached this threshold here where um, uh, they, they have, uh, these extremities have not been um, reduced or cut off. They're, they're still thriving. So what I'd like to ask you with this background that I gave, what do you think about the continued policy of sending the predator missiles over the border to Pakistan? And what, how is that really contributing to um, inciting more extremism, including this fellow in New York who claimed that, he said that's one reason why he did what he did, because he, they, they don't like the predator missiles. Um, and even I've read that civilians don't, I mean ordinary Pakistanis don't like it because their sovereignty has been violated. And so, I mean, what can, how dangerous is this towards another threat of, of some kind of uh, attack? And why isn't it, why do you think that our government, Peter King, is holding these, these sessions and he wants to find out why Muslims in America are, 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 are developing? Why, why isn't he asking, why, why aren't we asking why some of our own citizens, why are they turning, you know, instead of blaming? But if we're going to blame Muslims, well, there it is. The missiles in Pakistan is getting people very ex excited and enraged. And so maybe you could talk to that. Because why is it that the government has not failed to see some of these connections? And our own people, we're not seeing this. Thank you. It's a pretty complicated, convoluted, but... Uh, um, let me just say on this, uh, the, on the first issue, on the Pashtun factor, well, I think, you know, the, the major issue after 9-11 was that uh, President Bush was not interested in Afghanistan. You know, um, uh, within about nine months uh, after the defeat of the Taliban, uh, uh, the Americans were planning for Iraq. And all the, the, the resources and forces and troops and money and, and political support, et cetera, that should have gone into Afghanistan never went. So, I mean, you know, for the first four or five years in Afghanistan, 
the very, very little was done. There were less than 20,000 American troops um, in Afghanistan. And that, of course, gave the, um, uh, uh, the excuse for the Pakistanis to say, well, the Americans are going to leave. They're not serious about Afghanistan. They're going to leave us holding the cake. So we better support the Taliban, because at least the Taliban are pro-Pakistan. They're anti-Indian. Um, and, and so, um, uh, uh, and anyway, in a few years, the Americans and, uh, uh, will leave. So uh, that is why the military continued supporting uh, the Pashtun element, in other words, the Taliban, um, after 2001. Now, um, uh, the other part of your question on the drones, it's, uh, yes, it is a hugely controversial issue. There is, a, um, there is enormous anger. Um, but all the evidence coming out now, and there were certainly very serious civilian casualties um, carried out by the drones when they, when they started. Um, now it seems the drones are being much better targeted. And the, the latest figures, which were announced, in fact, two days ago by a Pakistani general, show a, huge, a, much, uh, a, 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 um, a much greater reduction in civilian casualties. Now the other thing is, let me tell you, that a lot of the Pashtuns in the tribal areas where the drones are landing, who are utterly fed up with the Taliban um, do n and with Al-Qaeda, do not see any action by the Pakistan army against the Taliban, and actually are, uh, you know, uh, uh, have been quite supportive of the drones. Now, this is not widespread, but certainly the local people, a lot of the local people who are not Taliban, um, and, a, and a uh, half the population in the tribal areas are, has actually fled because of the Taliban occupation of their, uh, Al-Qaeda Taliban occupation of their, of their areas and their villages and all the rest of it. Um, a lot of them are quite supportive of this. And, and the reason being given by many Pakistanis is that, look, if the army is not willing to go in and knock out these, these Pakistani Taliban, Al-Qaeda, these Afghan Taliban, and if the Americans are doing it through drones, well, let them, um, you know, at least somebody's doing it. But I agree that with the, the majority of Pakistanis are very much against the drones. And it is something that is certainly helping fuel anti-Americanism in Pakistan. Um, now, you know, the answer to this is, is if, if the drones were to stop um, and the tribal areas were to return to being a, uh, you know, a free territory for the Afghan Taliban to operate in and Al-Qaeda to operate in, um, Obviously, there would be far more American casualties in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and the American military is not going to allow that to happen. So, you know, it's a, it's, 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 it's a, very, it's a complicated um, uh, question. And I, I don't, you know, I genuinely, I would like to see the Pakistan army do more um, in rooting out Taliban uh, from this area and regaining control of these areas, which it has lost to the Taliban. Um, but unfortunately, that is not going to happen. So in the meantime, what we're going to have um, are these American drones. Uh, gentleman over here on my left, the far right. Is the United States dependent on Saudi oil and our continued support of Saudi Wahhabism destabilizing the, the South Asian area and other parts of the Islamic world? Yeah, you know, this has been a, a, a fairly um, widespread idea that, that, that Wahhabi and Saudi money and so on. And, I, and, and, you know, it's become part of the rhetoric here, and no one is questioning that. So we hear politicians say that, you know, we don't want to buy oil from people who want to kill us with, that, with the money we give them. But in the meanwhile, you know, we know that half the money that they buy the oil, we, we sell the oil, uh, they buy, uh, we buy the oil from them, the money they buy arms from us. They're good customers. Uh, Saudi Arabia has an economy of uh, uh, imports $52 billion uh, a year of goods. At least 50% that, of that comes from the United States. Uh, so it's a big importer. And the other question is the, the, the question of uh, um, whether the Saudi money is funneled into establishing these madrasas in Pakistan. Now, uh, Ahmed uh, believes that it does. And it does in some aspects, or some of the madrasas and so on are supported, but not, wi not widely. And secondly, I think that, I think we're giving the Saudis and the Wahhabi doctrine too much credit. This, the, the, the militancy in Pakistan, the resentment, is fueled by politics. 
you kill people, they're going to hate you. I mean, I mean, Al Qaeda, 17 Al Qaeda militants killed 2,000 people in New York. Look at the amount of hatred that it spawned out here. You don't think that happens on the other side? And I think that one of the interesting things is that Ahmed said that one of the questions that only in dialogue with the, Af with the Afghan Taliban is going to lead to stability. I think that the cycle in Pakistan of you're going to kill the Pakistani Taliban, if there's not going to be negotiation out there, Pakistan is going to be further imperiled. I believe that Pakistan will have to find ways of creating a situation in which the temperature is tamped down and also uh, the temperature comes down and all uh, tamped down and furthermore that you have dialogue with these extremist groups. Now, if they don't want to listen, then you have quite legitimate grounds to, 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 to obliterate them militarily. But the question is here, we have such polarized perceptions. One, in some people's view, these people are true freedom fighters. In other people's view, they are complete terrorists. And these are, you know, because there's occupation happening on the other side, there's solidarity from the side. So it's, it's, there's a gray area here. It's not black and white. And so I think the simplistic interpretation that the Saudi money, Saudi Arabia hates Al Qaeda. They are killing more Al Qaeda people than Pakistani government can ever kill. Or they are arresting so many people out there. But there is a certain amount of sympathy on the part of some Saudis for the political strategies of Al Qaeda. But I think the whole question about money, and there was a time in the 70s that a lot of money from Rabitat al Alam al-Islami and kind of a, a, a government-sponsored uh, organization that gave a lot of money to all kinds of organizations around the world. And of course, uh, you know, the, it's, it's a kind of a dumb version of theology, a black and white version of theology, but uh, it's not widely accepted uh, in, in all parts of the country, so, uh, or in Pakistan or India, other places. I believe there's also some kind of influence of that in Central Asia, but I think it makes for a very neat copy, but I don't think it addresses the real questions of what mobilizes, what mobilizes the, 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 the militancy. Um, I, I, it's, it's not going to be, I, I haven't seen the kind of evidence to support that. Uh, I saw the gentleman here, right, in the leather, yes. I see many hands, though. So. <laughs> uh, a question to either party, whoever is best qualified to answer. Um, if uh, the Taliban gave up bin Laden back in 2001, what do you think the situation would be? Uh, question one. And question two is, if they are, tr if, if, the, if the Afghan Taliban are really more of a, uh, n a national organization that cares about Afghani interests first and not, uh, you know, not a fundamentalist, religious fundamentalist movement, why didn't they? Well, you know, there was a debate in the Taliban uh, uh, between um, uh, September 11th and um, uh, when the war started in November. Um, and uh, Mullah Omar, essentially the leader of the Taliban, had befriended bin Laden. Bin Laden had given them a lot of money. Um, uh, and um, uh, there was a debate in the Taliban. There was, but the main moderate Taliban leader, a guy called Mullah Rabbani, who uh, uh, was very keen to get rid of not just bin Laden, but all the Arabs um, who were then in Afghanistan, had, had just died a few months earlier. And if he had been alive, uh, uh, he had a lot of support. He was a very strong political figure. He was, he was the prime minister of Afghanistan. He ran the functioning government in Kabul. Um, if he had been alive, perhaps it would have been very different. Um, but unfortunately, Mullah Omar held sway over what was um, then you know, uh, this debate. I think, obviously, if they had um, given up bin Laden, and not just given up bin Laden, because they would have had to give up some 2,000 Arabs, totally dismantled the um, uh, Al-Qaeda organization in Afghanistan, which at that time was pretty strong, because Al-Qaeda, as I described to you, was training all these other foreigners, Central Asians, Pakistanis, Kashmiris, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, they would have had to, dis the Taliban would have had to allow the international community to dismantle all that um, in order to avoid the war. And it's not clear exactly whether, you know, it wasn't just a question of giving up one guy. It was a question of actually dismantling Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Just on that point, uh, a, a something that I learned on 14th of January, Turki Al-Faisal, who was national uh, intelligence head in Saudi Arabia, regaled us on that morning with a detailed account of of his two meetings with, with bin Laden, the one that, during the Gulf War, bin Laden comes to him and says, you know, don't let the Americans come. We can do the job, and he gets turned down. 
But then he also goes to meet Mullah Omar during the Clinton years and, and, and before the attacks on Dar es Salaam and, and, and on Nairobi, on the US embassies. And so before that he goes and Mullah Omar and others were fairly open because Saudi Arabia wanted bin Laden. They wanted bin Laden back, they wanted to try him, they knew he was trouble for them. Uh, they were quite agreeable, they were working on a set of formulas and so on. And then in 1998, when the attacks happened, Clinton sent over the, 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 these missiles that hit uh, certain camps. And uh, Turki al-Faisal said when they went back the second time, Mullah Omar was just livid and wouldn't want to talk with them at all. And the negotiations about, about that was over. So there was a moment, maybe not after 9-11, but prior to that, that if the various intelligence agencies were informing each other what they were doing, if the Saudis were telling the US and the US did not take this kind of unilateral actions, or what they could have gotten the prize without lobbing missiles, then it could have been different. But that is now, you know, what if. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you both very much. Uh, I'm especially or interested about the, the idea of uh, your, as this gentleman over here said, the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan as being primarily motivated by nationalistic as opposed to global jihadist uh, interests. And I remember in the 90s when the Taliban did seize power, it was welcomed uh, to put an end to the, the endless disruption. Under what conditions do you think the Taliban and the current government could come to some kind of agreement? And under what conditions would the United States be willing to accept that? And I'm thinking especially of the very strong um, uh, reaction in the United States to the Taliban's uh, oppression of women and whether that would be a condition that would break the possibility of the United States uh, accepting a government in Kabul with Taliban participation. Yeah, we might need to do Secretary of State, is that what you know? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, this is one of, of, of um, uh, this is a very important issue. Look, I, I see a, a, a Taliban, and I've written about this extensively in the New York Review of Books recently, um, uh, how a negotiation would be framed. Um, I think the first, w w what needs to be done is that between the Kabul government and the Taliban, and between the Americans and the Taliban, if there is a negotiation, there would need, first of all, to be a series of confidence-building measures between the two. So you would try and reduce the violence. So America would say, well, we'll stop night raids, we'll stop these special forces. Uh, the Taliban would say, we would stop killing certain people in certain areas or something like that. So you would build up towards more and more of these kind of measures. Then you would actually get down to the business of negotiation. Now, I think there would be two major kind of political areas for negotiation. The first would be some kind of power sharing. What would the future government look like? Would the Taliban be demanding ministries, um, um, official positions in the government? Uh, uh, what kind of negotiation, you know, how would that negotiation go? I think that negotiation would actually be not too difficult because Afghans have always negotiated compromises with government, with each other over ministries, sharing power, etc. The other complicated would be the, the Taliban are still demanding Sharia, Islamic law. Now, Af Afghanistan has a constitution, which is a modern constitution, but it's also considered to be an Islamic constitution. Um, and the, the government in the West would naturally say, the Taliban have to recognize this constitution, which of course enshrines women's rights, education, right to work, everything else. Um, and the Taliban will say, no, this is not sufficiently Islamic. You, uh, uh, we want a full implementation of Sharia law. Now, um, I think clearly that would be the most difficult area um, of, of, of negotiation. But I don't think it's impossible. For example, in almost all provinces, something that the Western media has not picked up on, but in the last six months, the Taliban have commanders and governors. They have shadow governors in every province. They have actually allowed now um, uh, um, you know, uh, girls to go to school. And they have said, we will not burn any more schools. And if anybody is burning the schools, it's not us. It is some other group that is burning the schools. And actually, there has been a huge reduction. Pakistani Taliban are burning schools in Pakistan. The Afghan Taliban are not burning schools anymore. So I think, and the other thing is, I think the role of women. Um, I, I was in Kabul recently, and I addressed a, a large convocation of Afghan women, and I said, look, you have to be upfront about this. 
Karzai, you have to force yourself into the negotiating process. The Taliban have to be confronted with the new Afghan woman. Remember that Afghan women are now in the workforce. You know, 60% of teachers and health workers are women. Um, and that's been an incredibly positive, you know, uh, development in the last 11 years. Now, oh, th these women have a voice, and these are, these, are Afga these are kinds of Afghan women who the Taliban have never confronted before. They've never seen an Afghan woman without head covering, who's a doctor, who's a nurse, or who's a teacher or a university professor. And they need to be, so Af Afghan women need to be on the negotiating team with the Af Now, that's why the Americans are needed, why the UN is needed, why the West, because Karzai is not going to do these things on his own. He's, he's going to have to be pressured to do these things, you know. You need women on the negotiating team. You need women to confront the, to sit on the table opposite the Taliban. So, um, you know, I think these things are possible because I think in the, in the, bro you know, the Taliban are really now, I think they, have, they, they are, um, uh, they've taken enormous casualties. They're very tired of the war and fighting. They're fed up with being manipulated in Pakistan by the Pakistanis. And, 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 and most importantly, I think what the Taliban realized is that if they were to seize power again, they would fail in six months. Because obviously, aid would stop, money would stop, all cooperation would stop. They would be totally alienated. And they would lose the Afghan population completely. And the Taliban leadership recognizes this. And they realize that it's much more, say, let's go into partnership with someone like Karzai, who would keep the, the fire burning, who would keep the aid coming, who would keep the, you know, the money coming in. It's a, we, we, if we were on our own, you know, we would be finished in six months. The Afghan people would turn against us. So I, th I think, you know, there's a lot of scope. I mean, that, you know, you, you negotiated with the Vietnamese for seven <coughs> years or, or six years, I can't remember. <coughs> um, uh, and, and even then, I mean, you know, but so you can imagine that this negotiation is not going to be easy. It's going to take a long time. And the quicker you start, the better it'll be. Yes, lady here. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just had a simple question. Thank you. Um, this is for Professor Musa. I wanted to ask you if you could sort of go back and discuss really the crisis of religious authority where, you know, Saudi accountants and Egyptian surgeons can claim for themselves a religious authority where they, in classical Islamic theory, would not have had that authority. So if you could sort of just discuss this vis-a-vis classical Islamic theories of just war and jihad, yeah. so to speak. And you know, how they're able to sort of, I mean, they would say it's because Muslims don't have anybody who would defend them, et cetera. But if you could elaborate on that. Yeah. And uh, because if I remember right after 9-11, we talked about sort of the Al-Qaeda agenda, which it seemed to me was a perfectly political agenda. There wasn't any clause in there that said we want to convert Bush and Cheney to Islam. Uh, you know, it was Israel bases occupation. So it was a political agenda. I didn't see any religious agenda on that, um, the document that they put out, which was discussed widely after 9-11. The second question is for Mr. Rashid is um, sort of on that note, you discussed this global jihadist agenda. I mean, and this decentralization of Al-Qaeda after 9-11, are you suggesting now that they've sort of mutated into something that no longer has a real political agenda? I mean, you know, these random bombings in Sweden and Denmark and they can't possibly thinking they want to bring Sharia to Denmark. I mean, sort of, if you could discuss sort of what, what that mutation is, if, the, if it indeed is true, and it's still not just a political agenda, motivated true by religion, but against what they may see as uh, Western occupations, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I mean, I, I'm not going to address your second question, but I, I think that, I mean, what could really demoralize Al-Qaeda is if those kind of movements that are happening in Tunisia and other places really catch on fire and really develop into stable situations, then Al-Qaeda can be rendered redundant. And I think the legitimacy to, out, to root out Al-Qaeda can be increased within Muslim communities. But you need to see some kind of success story first. But I think your question about the religious authority, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a long story, but I'll try and do it, abbreviate it. I mean, I think for, for much of the 19th and 20th century, traditional religious authority has been losing the game in understanding the world. So while we have a lot of credibility with people who have all the kind of paraphernalia of what, of what Islam should look like, you know, regulation beards, certain kinds of clothing, 
talking the kind of language of, uh, you know, because they are traditionalists, they have the authority, um, they've been losing ground gradually as Muslim societies have been modernizing. And they have not been able to keep up with the pace of providing an interpretation of Islam that squares with the new social realities. What has emerged side by side with that is a kind of reformist Islam that have asked people that yes, in Islam there is no ecclesia, there is no church, every individual can do the work and understanding religion, you just require an ijtihad is open, is, 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 a, is a right to interpret and to uh, uh, every individual has that and said you can read the Quran for yourself. So Muhammad Abdul Rashid Rida, the kind of Islamic modernizers and so on, said to people go and read the Quran for yourself. Um, Jamaat Islami, Muslim Brotherhood, all those organizations for instance said to people read the Quran for yourself. Once people start reading the Quran for themselves, a different kind of empowerment takes place that basically is a very dangerous kind of empowerment because you're taking a 7th century document and you're telling a doctor to read it. Or you're asking an engineer to read it. And they read it through a positivistic lens and they're trying to do, read it now as an engineering manual or read it as a medical manual. And now they're trying to find Islamic medicine and trying to find Islamic engineering and they're trying Islamic everything, which is not the history of Islam. Muslims were great engineers, but they didn't read the Quran to become great engineers. <laughs> Muslims became great physicians. They never read the Quran to become physicians in the history. But now you have bizarre stuff of people finding Quranic medicine and finding, you know, finding the, the jinn to, in order to create, create energy and electricity at a conference that was held in Islamabad uh, 15 years ago. And you have this kind of bizarre stuff. So what has happened is that this kind of, so you don't have good authority because this authority is becoming anachronistic. You have this kind of new emerging reformist authority, and that is the product that gives you the Muslim Brotherhood, that gives you the kind of what I call dial, uh, you know, 1-800 dial a verse of Quran kind of, kind of thing that people want to take one verse and they believe that they can understand the whole of Islam. And so that's what we have. So therefore you have the Bin Laden and the Zawahiris who've come to the fore because they have a much more powerful religio-political rhetoric that answers some of the grievances that people have but it's not the solution, but it's basically just giving them the kind of, uh, what I would call kind of band aid solutions, but really is not the solution and really further made it more complex. And what is now happening in different parts of the world is that the traditionalists are now capitulating to this kind of, hmm. what I would call very, very kind of crude uh, uh, reformers agenda. You get, you get fairly sophisticated reformers agendas and you get crude ones. And those crude ones are now, for instance, holding holding the pattern. So you can find ordinary Muslims talking very passionately about Islam, but from where, what I know, it's a very, very kind of, you know, uh, uh, bizarre, but, uh, and not very an informed position. So people say Islam has always been the answer. It's not like that. You, there's no history. So what we now have in this kind of reformers version of, of an Islam without a history. And that's when, if you only go to read the Quran and don't understand the history of the development and the emergence of this tradition over time and how it encounters time, then you're gonna have the kind of dangers that now it becomes religiously toxic. That's my short answer. I think, I, I think your, your uh, question is really important for Pakistan because you, you have precisely seen this complete erosion of religious authority. And unfortunately, p part of the reason why it's happened is because the state has sponsored extremist groups who have taken it upon themselves to erode that religious authority. So when you have, you know, lashkar e tayyaba which is run by an engineer, and you have jaish e Muhammad, which is run by um, a, a teacher, um, you know, you've got these militant groups endorsed by the military and the intelligence. Um, naturally, a, a traditional religious authority is going to be totally eroded. Now, I mean, when, when I grew up, you know, you could, the, the state still had control over um, for example, the Friday khutbah, you know, the Friday sermon um, uh, at the mosque, so that across the country there would be one, the government would, would give out a themes for the Friday sermon, and you could be guaranteed that every mosque would more or less carry that same theme. Today, every mosque can do what, does what it's like. State authority is totally eroded, unfortunately. So, um, briefly, well, uh, as far as your question on Al-Qaeda is concerned, let me just say that, you know, as Al-Qaeda, has become so diffuse and so decentralized and so undefinable or multi-definable, as I tried to talk 
you know, as I said in my speech. Um, I think the reasons for carrying out um, these bombings are also multi multi-dimensional, multi-explainable. Um, yes, for some it is the political agenda. For some it is a, a, a jihadist agenda. In other words, Islam has been reduced to just to jihad. You have abandoned all other, all the facets of your religion, the good things about it, everything, and you've reduced it to this one item of, 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 of jihad. Um, that there's also the sense of you know, moral superiority. You feel morally superior to these Westerners, these non-Muslims, and you feel that you know, you, in, in killing yourself um, uh, and in killing as many of them as you can, um, somehow this increases your uh, moral superiority. There's a question of punishment. You feel that these Westerners, these Americans, because of their foreign policy, whatever, have to be punished. So, you know, I mean, I'm giving you a whole, I'm giving you, you know, off the top of my head, I'm giving you all sorts of reasons why people are doing what they're doing, you know, carrying out suicide attacks um, against Western targets. So I don't think you can just simply say that, oh, the, has the political agenda gone for the religious agenda or vice versa? It's, it's an undefinable, you know, what was in the head of the special Shahzad who did New Times? It was completely the, the guy who wanted to kill the, 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 the Danish cartoonist. You know, this was punishment for the, for the Danish cartoonist because he abused the prophet, you know, in a cartoon. Um, what exactly was the he in the head of this boy? Uh, you know, uh, alienation, frustration. Uh, it, it, it was something else altogether. Our time is almost up, um, <clears throat> and I'm in the unenviable position of having to choose the last questioner. So without any uh, a slight meant to the rest of you, I'll choose the woman in the back here on the left. Yes. Following up on the last question as well, I noticed a difference between you that um, Dr. Rashid uses the word fundamentalist and fundamentalist groups, and Dr. Musa does not. And you also were speaking, uh, Dr. Musa, of the, the rhetoric of incomparability vis-a-vis -vis the madrasas and so on. So I'd love to know, do you use the term? And if so, why or why not? And how important is the naming process in the ways in which we both an analyze the phenomena that we're studying and um, then uh, seek uh, possible dialogue with those who are named in certain ways? Well, I read a lot of uh, 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 Mr. Rashid's uh, pieces, uh, reading very closely in the New York Review of Books and elsewhere. Uh, but, but I don't think he's been in my seminar. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so we, we can have a long conversation about this question of fundamentalism. I think, the, 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 I think fundamentalism is, is, a, is a quick term to explain, but it means a lot of things in different places. And therefore, I try to avoid the use, and I rather try to explain the phenomenon, okay? Uh, because it has one kind of ring in the United States where it was kind of biblical inerrancy and understanding the Bible and so on. And, and that term was just used after 1979, what happened in Iran, and so suddenly has become now a kind of a, a scare term for, for liberal Americans, uh, maybe not so for conservative Americans. Uh, so I think that um, that is not exactly what is happening, but we are having comparable phenomenon of that kind of thing happening in, in different places. But you know, here, I mean, fundamentalism did not give rise to vast kind of levels of violence and what's in it. In, so what people call fundamentalism in different parts of the, uh, of the parts of the Muslim world are really political, theological battles being fought out, given much more complex questions of dictatorship, foreign occupation, and those kind of issues. So I prefer to describe the phenomenon and to give more accuracy to both the understanding of the issue and because I think that the word fundamentalism hides more than what it explains. But it is a media term that, that sells well. Uh, and and you know and you know in, when you're writing a 800 word piece article, you're going to spend two paragraphs and trying to explain this fundamental from that one. The article is over. So, in some ways, but but as we this morning's workshop that I've come here for and Professor Rashid been talking about is that we we are also trying to nuance and relearn of how to educate our audiences. So we might have to find ways of talking about those issues in brief and in and and also in terms of uh, sound bites that will be more informative. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, you know, I should be more careful in the way I, 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 I use this terminology, but being a, a journalist, I tend to be a bit slack on, on, on these issues. I'm not an academic. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I define fundamentalists as, you know, fundamentalists are not terrorists. 
Fundamentalists are those who, you know, who believe in um, a, a fundamentalist interpretation of religion. Uh, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, whatever. And in the Muslim case, it invariably involves, you know, uh, uh, a desire for Sharia law, Sharia justice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I would use the word extremist for uh, the kind of extreme, you know, terrorist groups that I'm talking about, that I've been talking about. And I think, you know, um, and of course, you know, as a journalist, I have to use a shorthand, uh, uh, a shorthand that that generally people understand. Um, uh, and as uh, you know, you you. You can't define these terms in every single article you write. Uh, another way that uh, a Chicago University professor has defined fundamentalism is maximalism. In other words, where, where religion, uh, Bruce Lincoln writes that you know you have to use, you use religion uh, to do a maximum amount of social social functions, which in a modern society, where in societies where we begin to con conceptualize religion being in the realm of the private, and there's a kind of secular public and so on, uh, religion has a different role. Now, the question of religion in many Muslim societies, and we're going to see this happening in Egypt, and we're going to see this happening in Tunisia, the question of the place of religion in society has yet not been resolved. Whether religion has, I mean, the issue that's debated now in, Iran, uh, in, in Egypt, for instance, is in the constitution of Sharia being the central, central the source of law, right? How, and, and some Copts are questioning that issue. Because that was done as a, as a SOP to certain kind of religious groups in Egypt under, under Sadat, and when they amended the constitution to do that, uh, because the state wanted to out-Islamize its opponents. Uh, but what does that mean, and what's the interpretation of that? And in many Muslim societies, this thing of secular, religious, secular is a different kind. So uh, in America, secularism means that the state, shall, uh, the government shall not legislate religion, uh, not legislate on the basis of religion. That's what it means. But American society is full of religion. Public discourse is full of religion. Uh, in Muslim societies, that bar of, legislate, of, of legislating on religion or using religious to inspire legislation that is both valid and has been accepted, but also highly problematic because you're taking laws that are devised in different kinds of societies, 1400 years later, you want to give it legislative force. It has tremendous amount of, 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 of uh, uh, miscarriages of justice. And, and these are some of the issues on Islamic reform that have really not been seriously thought about and not been debated, and there's no space for the debate because even any kind of debate means that the heresy card goes out and people get, get executed. So it's a much more uh, 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 you know, deeper problem and requires much more creative uh, solutions to address those issues. With that, I think uh, it is time to call our evening to a close. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for attending and for your questions. I'd especially like to thank our two distinguished speakers for uh, making this such a stimulating event and their wonderful presentations, and I hope you will join me er, in thanking them. The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.